Hello again. Today is the third lesson on graphs and transformations. So in this video we're going to learn about sketching graphs carefully and accurately, and also how the numbers of intersections of graphs is one and the same thing as the number of solutions to a set of equations. So before we begin, I've prepared four warm-up questions for you. Here they are. So try them now yourself. Use the video to double check your answer afterwards. And if you've made a mistake, again, just use the video to just see where you've gone wrong and try to understand what to do next time. So let's have a look together at the solution to the first question. So for question one, we have to sketch the graphs of the following functions on the same axes provided. So the first one we've got to do is f of x equals x squared plus 2x. And of course, we need to label all points of intersection with the coordinate axes. So for the first one, where we have f of x is equal to x squared plus 2x, the first thing to notice is this will factorise. So we can factorise out an x, and that gives us x plus 2. So this is going to have roots when x is 0 and when x is minus 2. So in other words, we know where the graph is going to intersect the x-axis. We can also work out what the y-intercept is by substituting in when x is 0. Well, when x is 0, this whole thing just becomes 0. So we know that the y-intercept is 0. It's going to go through the origin. It's also a quadratic with a positive coefficient on the x squared. So it's going to be a u-shaped parabola. And so if anything to do now is to follow through and try and sketch this on. So here we go. Down and up through zero, like that. So that's our sketch for f of x. Now fortunately for me, g of x is a straight line, so I don't need to worry so much about sketching this one because it's much simpler to sketch. So this one here, g of x, uh, equals zero when x equals minus a half. You can see this easily enough. If you wrote an equation, 0 equals 2x plus 1, subtract 1 from both sides and half, it has a root when x is minus a half. Okay, so it's going to cross the axis about there, so that's minus a half. Oh, almost forgot as well, I didn't label the intersection for f of x, so I need to label this as being minus 2. Also as well, because this g of x is in the form y equals mx plus c, we can see here that the y-axis intercept is going to be at 1. So I can label in 1 like this. And then the only thing that needs to be done is to draw a straight line um, through these points. So g of x is going to look something like this. Like so. And of course, f of x will eventually come up and hit g of x, so there's going to be two solutions for this one. And so there we have g of x. For question two, some more sketching. Now we have h and g again. So h of x is x squared brackets 2 minus x. And so we can use our knowledge of functions and cubics here to realise that h of x is going to have a repeated root when x is 0 because of this x squared term. So it's going to have a repeated root at x equals 0. And another root when x is 2 because when x is 2 this bracket becomes 0. And more than that, because this is x squared multiplied by minus x, it's going to be a negative cubic shape. It's going to be a cubic going like this. 
And so it's going to bounce at 2, if you like, bounce isn't a technical term. The x-axis is going to be a tangent to the curve, is a better term to use. And it's going to go down again at 2. So let's have a go at sketching this one. Okay, so it's going to come down, curve at to 0, sort of bounce up again, and then down. So just label on the intersection here, which is at 2. And then the same way, we draw g of x again. So g of x, as you can recall, that was a straight line. Something like this. Let's make that slightly longer. And the same as question 1, we can recall that for g of x, the y-axis intercept was at 1. Just label this on here. And also the x-axis intercept was at minus a half. So that's question two sorted. Now for question three, we're told to use information in question one to solve the Blow equation f of x equals g of x. So f of x was x squared plus 2x and g of x was defined as being 2x plus 1. And so if we're setting one equal to the other, all that means is we need to solve where f of x which is x squared plus 2x, is equal to g of x, which is defined as 2x plus 1. So we can arrange this into the standard form for a quadratic. In fact, it might be easier to spot because we have 2x on both sides. They cancel out straight away. And so what we have now is just for x squared equals 1, we can then subtract 1 and factorise, or we can just straight away just square root both sides. So if we square root x squared, we'll get x. And square root 1, but consider, of course, both positive and negative roots. Very important. x isn't just 1. x isn't just minus 1. x is either 1 or minus 1. So both options must be accounted for. For part b... It asks us to use a sketch from question 2 to write down the number of real solutions to the equation x squared brackets 2 minus x equals 2x plus 1. Note very carefully, this question isn't asking us to solve this equation, it just wants us to answer how many solutions the equation would have. And so if I just return our memories to our sketch from question 2, we had something that looked a bit like this. I've just shrunk it down so it fits onto this screen. So the number of real solutions is just the number of intersections of these two graphs. So we can clearly see here, there's only one point of intersection, which is here. So we can just make the note that because there's one point of intersection, that's one and the same thing as saying there's one solution. One intersection, therefore, whoops, this pen's going a bit strange today. So therefore, one solution. Question four. On the axes provided in question one, we need to sketch the linear graph y equals x minus one. And again, what we can do is just remind ourselves of the graph we had from before, which we have here. And now we need to just sketch on y equals x minus 1. So the y-axis intercept for this one is going to be at minus 1, quite obviously. So it's going to start down here. That's going to have a positive gradient. And so if I do this in blue, okay, the key being this is y equals x minus 1, it's going to start through minus 1 and have a gradient of 1, which is less steep than this green line, which was 2x plus 1, which has a gradient of 2. So it's going to be something a bit like this. Okay? So we can label on, but this is y equals x minus 1. It now says to show graphically that the equation x squared plus 2x equals x minus 1 has no real solutions. So all it's saying here 
is this x squared plus 2x, if you remember from question 1, this is the equation of this red parabola, which I'm just going over in the yellow highlighter. Okay, and all we need to show here is that it doesn't intersect with this blue line, which was x minus 1, which we just drew on just now. Okay, so clearly this red line doesn't touch the blue line. The highlighting may overlap, but the actual lines don't. So because they don't intersect, they don't have any solutions. So we just need to make a statement to that effect. So there's no real solutions. Since the graphs do not meet or intersect. And that's really all you have to do for that one. And that concludes the warm-up questions. We now need to mention a bit about reciprocal graphs. So let's start off by just mentioning what they are and what I mean by them. So a reciprocal function, a reciprocal graph, sends each input value, let's call it x, to its multiplicative inverse, 1 over x. If you just think back to GCSE for a moment, if you had a question, for example, it says, what's the reciprocal of 5? It just means 1 over something. In other words, 1 divided by the input you have been given. So it's always going to be in the case of something divided by a variable. We can sketch reciprocal graphs by considering what's called their asymptotes. An asymptote is a straight line. So for AS, they'll either be vertical asymptotes or horizontal asymptotes. And a curve approaches an asymptote if a curve has an asymptote at all until it gets infinitesimally close to it. But if a curve has an asymptote, it can never quite touch it, but it can get infinitely close to it. So the distance goes towards zero without actually quite ever getting to zero. So this is just mentioned here. So as x gets really big or really small, it goes very, very close to the asymptote without actually ever touching it. Reciprocal functions have horizontal and vertical asymptotes. And we can find the equations by the asymptotes by considering things in the following way. So horizontal asymptotes we find these by letting a be the value that the reciprocal function approaches when x grows incredibly large, goes towards positive infinity, and when x goes incredibly small, towards negative infinity. The horizontal asymptote will have equation equal to y equals a. So whatever value it approaches when x goes towards infinity or negative infinity, y equals that value is the equation of the horizontal asymptote. The vertical ones, all you need to do for the vertical ones is just have a look at the denominator and think what value does x or whatever need to be to make that denominator equal to zero. Whatever value of x or the variable makes the denominator equal to zero, call that b and x equal to that value is the equation of a vertical asymptote. But, as ever, the easiest thing to do is to have a look at some examples to get this idea solidified in your mind. So, I've got some diagrams here for you to have a look at, and they need to be matched to equations. So, each equation will feature k, which is a constant. We need to think about what the function on the constant needs to be. So, these are also given in the boxes below. So, this is just a matching exercise to do in pairs. Or if you've not got a pair with you, do it on your own and you can use this video to help you through the solutions. So, here we have A, B, C and D, the four main forms of reciprocal graphs. And we need to match each of these blue results to either A, B, C or D. And so for A, where we have asymptotes on the y and x axes, as they all do by the way, and one bit of the curve is in the positive first quadrant and the other bit is in this third quadrant here and then this is going to be of the form the general form 
y equals k over x, where k is some positive constant. So you've noticed here, almost not as a trick, but just to make things simple, we can simplify things by just saying k has to be a positive constant. You could have it where k is negative. All that would happen there is these would be mirrored in the x-axis, and so this graph type would become that graph type. And so you could have y equals k over x, where k is greater than zero, or you could say this is y equals minus k over x, where k is less than zero. So just to keep things simple, let's just define k as a positive constant for all of these. That also has the nice effect of thinning out these options below. So let's just define k greater than zero. This one here, as I've alluded to by mentioning y equals k over x for a, this is when k is going to be a negative, minus k rather, is going to be a negative thing. So this one here is y equals minus k over x, where k is greater than zero. So this might be minus 2 over x or minus 4 over x, whatever. But the general form will be like this. C, if you have a look here, no matter what the input of x, whether x being positive or negative, the output, the function range, is always non-negative. It's always positive. And so what can we divide by to make the outcome positive no matter what? Well, the answer is something squared. And so this one here is going to be y equals k over x squared, where k is positive. Something positive divided by something always positive will pop out like this, something always positive. Likewise here, this is always negative, and that will happen when we have y equals minus k over x squared, where k is positive. So this might be something like minus 10 over x squared x squared is always positive, so minus 10 or whatever divided by something positive will always give you something negative. So we've got these general forms now. Now we need to just match up these particular specific ones to each of the general. And so you can see here, for example, this first one, y equals minus 4 over x squared, that's going to fit to this one here. So in this case, k is 4. This one here, y equals minus 2 all squared over x. Well, minus 2 all squared is positive 4. And so this one will actually match over here. Another one to have a look at. y equals minus 5 over x. That's got to match to this one. y equals 3 over x squared needs to match here y equals 2 over x will match to this one, y equals 200 over x, that's 100 times bigger on the numerator but it would still have this same characteristic shape, okay, with asymptotes on the y-axis and x-axis. The final one to match, y equals 2 over x squared, that's going to match up to this one over here. Okay, so now we've got these all matched up, so we're done. Next, just to have a look at points of intersection on graphs. So we talked about this briefly in the warm-up. Um, the number of solutions to any given equation can be worked out by sketching curves, as long as the sketch is accurate. Okay, so the x-coordinates at the points of intersection of the curves with equations, for example, f of x and g of x, are the solutions to the equation f of x equals g of x. And like we mentioned on the warm-up, the number of solutions is the same as the number of intersections. Let's just have a look at this example one. So suppose we wish to determine the number of solutions to this equation here. There's two main methods. The first one is we can sketch the curves and see how many points of intersection we have. So let's do this first of all. So let's sketch out f of x equals x squared minus 6x plus 8. So what we're going to have here is, luckily for us, something that factorises. So f of x, we can rewrite this as being x minus 4, x minus 2. Because minus 4 times minus 2 gives us positive 8, 
and minus 4 add minus 2 is minus 6. So we know that the roots of this are going to be at 2 and 4. So we can write those in straight away, 2 and 4. And as well, it's going to have a y-axis intercept at 8. So this curve is going to look something a bit like this. I only wish I could sketch curves better, but you get the idea of what I was going for. I hope. So that's 8. Whoa, sorry about that. So this is 8, this one here is 2, and over here we have 4. And g of x is x plus 2, so that's very easy to sketch. So it's going to have a y-axis intercept at 2, and when x is minus 2, that's going to make g of x equal to 0. So the x-axis intercept is going to be at minus 2. So we can just draw this on as well. So it's going to be something like this. So that's g of x, and the quadratic was f of x. For part b, we're asked to work out how many points of intersection these curves have, the curve and the line, and that's also the number of solutions to this. And so we can see here, in terms of the number of points of intersection, that there's two. We have two points of intersection. We have this one over here, and this point here. So we can just write two points of intersection, two intersections, therefore two solutions. Or what we could have done is solved it algebraically and then seen how many solutions we get from that. So either it has two solutions, but it has one repeated solution, or if this rearranges to a quadratic with a discriminant which is negative, it might have no solutions, they might never cross. So we're just seeing when this yellow function here, x squared minus 6x plus 8, meets x plus 2. So we're just seeing when the yellow, this one here, meets the green. And obviously, spoiler alert, we already know, don't we? We already know what it is. But let's just show that we can use this different method. So we're expecting there to be two solutions, obviously, because there are. So if we wanted to do it algebraically, we could rearrange and solve. And so if we take this and subtract x and 2 from both sides, we would get x squared minus 7x plus 6 equals 0. Now we can think of two numbers that multiply together to give us 6 and add up to minus 7. That's going to be minus 1 and minus 6. So therefore, we again see there's two solutions. So the two solutions are where x equals 1 and where x equals 6. And this is more powerful in this case because it just so happens to factorise quite easily. So when x equals 1, we can sub in 1 into, for example, g of x g of x would be 1 plus 2, which is 3. And so x would be 1, and y would be 3. Or if x is 6, g of x, which is the same as y, would be 6 plus 2, which is 8. And so this algebraic way just so happens to be more powerful in this instance, because we have something we can understand and factorise, and get some nice, neat solutions and coordinates. Sometimes, however, we can't factorise or solve very neatly, which doesn't stop us from sketching the graphs. And so sometimes a graph scratch is more useful, other times an algebraic approach is better. So mastering both approaches is crucial in terms of mastering these concepts and scoring maximum marks in your exam, which is ultimately the end game. 
In this example, we need to determine the number of solutions to the equation x cubed equals x plus 2. So like I was mentioning for example 1, the algebraic approach was better because we could manipulate it, we could factorise it, we could solve it nicely. Here we can't. So we could use the cubic formula, which is degree level and an absolute nightmare. If you are that way inclined, if you're thinking what is a cubic formula, be my guest, go on to YouTube, there are some videos there, but it is an ugly, pretty unwieldy beast. Okay, so don't worry, you don't need to know the cubic formula for A level. But knowing that an equation has solutions or doesn't is at least half a problem. So sometimes, not having to solve it, but just knowing if there's a solution or not is half a battle in maths. And so algebraically, we wouldn't have a clue, but with a graph sketch, we can see how many solutions this one has. So the approach here is to take x cubed and x plus 2 as two separate functions. So what we're going to do first of all is graph the left hand side and imagine the function y equals x cubed. Okay, so for the previous lesson we should now know that this one is one that rises incredibly steeply and has only one root at the origin. When x gets big, this gets big very quickly. When x gets small, this gets small very quickly. So it has this sort of characteristic shape. Very, very, very steep. Comes in, gets narrower, approaches the origin, goes through it, then goes up and becomes really, really, really steep like this. Without that kink at the end. I always do that. I wish I didn't. So that's x cubed. Okay. And now what we need to consider is x plus 2. Okay, so if we graph y equals x plus 2. This is much easier to do. Okay, we know what the y-axis intercept is. It's going to have a y-axis intercept at 2. And it's going to cross the x-axis at minus 2. Okay, so if whatever you're thinking is, well, what's x cubed at x equals minus 2? How do we know it's not going to cross? How do I know, for example, it's not going to be something like this? How do I know that it's not like that? Because it's just a sketch. Well, if ever you're in doubt, do some calculations. So if you were to try minus 2 cubed, you would get minus 2 times minus 2 times minus 2, which is minus 8, okay? So it's going to be way down here, and x cubed is going to be curving away from this straight line, which has a gradient which just never increases. So have no illusions. If it doesn't touch here, it's never going to touch. Okay, so if I just draw this graph on in green, going through these two points, like so, and I can extend this line just so it looks as it should, something like that. And I can label this x plus 2. We see that there's only going to be one solution to this one. It's going to have one solution here somewhere. We're not asked what that solution is, we're just asked how many solutions it has. It just has one. It's not going to meet anywhere down here. After this point, the line and the curve are going to converge massively. Sorry, diverge. Can't get my words right today. We're going to diverge, we're going to move away from each other. So there's one intersection, there's one solution. So that's all we need to say. One point of intersection. Therefore, just one solution. This now is designed for an activity for you to try. So it's going to be using curve sketching to determine the number of solutions to given equations. So first of all, you have six different equations to sketch. I'm going to help you through these now. So sketch carefully the following curves on separate axes in the boxes provided. And so first of all, we need to do y plus 1 equals 0. So first of all, 
let's get some axes on here. Okay, so need an X and a Y. In fact, we do for all of these. So let's just do the same thing. So I'd recommend using a ruler for this. Sometimes I'm a bit naughty and I don't, but that's bad practice. Use a ruler, please. So for some of these, by the way, you're going to need to rearrange these equations. So y plus 1 equals 0. I would strongly suggest rearranging that. So for this one here, subtract 1 from both sides, it becomes y equals minus 1. So what we want for this one is a straight line where y is always minus 1. In other words, this one is just going to be a straight horizontal line crossing the y-axis at minus 1. y is always minus 1, just a straight line like such. Next up we have y equals x squared minus x. Well this one factorises. So this one we can say is the same as x brackets x minus 1. So that helps to inform our sketch. It's going to have roots at 0 and 1, and there's going to be a u-shaped parabola, because it's an x squared, and the coefficient of x squared is 1. So it's going to be a happy parabola, not that that's a technical term. So going through at 0 and 1, we're going to have a parabola looking something a bit like this. Okay, so that's y equals x squared minus x. This one here, we need to rearrange. So if we subtract the 1 over x on both sides, that tells us that we're graphing y equals minus 1 over x. At this point, it's worth remembering what we talked about before, what the graph of minus 1 over x looks like. What it looks like is this bit of the graph in this quadrant and also the same in the opposite quadrant over here. I'm going asymptotically close to the y-axis as it goes up, up and up and gets closer. I always make that silly kick at the end. There we go, sorry. Does it matter? Maybe not, but still annoys me. So that's a graph of y equals minus 1 over x. Now for the next three. We need to graph y equals 1 over x squared. So again, let's just put in the axes. y and x, y and x, y and x. Maybe I should have done this earlier, but never mind, no one's perfect. So, label this x, x here, and x there, and y, 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 did I not do that earlier? <laughs> okay, enough of that. So, y equals 1 over x squared. Remembering what we mentioned before, this has a certain characteristic shape, which is, as such, asymptotically close to the y-axis, then tapers down, goes asymptotically close to the x-axis, as we go towards positive infinity. Same at the other side, starts high, comes down, and tails off, and goes asymptotically close to the x-axis, as we go the other way. Next up, y equals x brackets x minus 1 squared. This is a cubic. Now the highest power of x, the cube, is positive. x times x squared is going to be a positive looking cubic. It's going to have a root at 0. When x is 0, this whole thing is 0. And as well, when x is 1, this bracket becomes 0 too. So it's going to be having roots at 0 at 1. But because the bracket is squared, it's going to be a repeated root at 1. So it's going to bounce at 1. So it's going to be something a bit like this. It's going to start low, come up, through 0, go back down again, 
just touch the x-axis at 1, then rise back up quicker and quicker. So that's a sketch of y equals x brackets x minus 1 all squared. The last one is very similar to the fifth, only this time it's quartic and it's x squared, so it's got two repeated roots, a repeated root at 0 and a repeated root at 1. And so because it's quartic, it's going to look something like this. It's going to come down, going to scrape at the origin, back up a bit, back down, scrape at 1, and back up again. So that's meant to touch the x-axis. doesn't quite, but hopefully you'll see what I mean. So there are the sketches. So now what we need to do with these sketches is the following. What we need to do is we use the sketches to classify the following equations into the categories of either having zero solutions, one solution, or two solutions as shown. So you've got A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I. So the tip here is we're going to use these sketches. I've cheated here. These are generated online using desmos.com, which I can't praise highly enough. Desmos, my hats, my hat goes off to you. I don't have hats, just for one top hat. So let's have a look at A, for example. A, we've got x brackets x minus 1 all squared. Okay, now we graph this here. And so we need to imagine when this one would meet this one, which is minus 1 over x. So we graphed y equals minus 1 over x here. If this rearranges, remember, to y equals minus 1 over x. In fact, I'll just write this in now. So what we need to think about is when would this yellow intersect with the green? And so if I superimpose this green graph onto the yellow, we'd have something looking a bit like this. and this quadrant going down here. And so hopefully you'll see, actually they'd never touch. Because they'd never intersect, they would have no solutions in common. And so for A, that's no solutions. So where you say, where you've got A written on your worksheet, put zero for zero solutions, or just write simply zero solutions. So we've done A, let's move on. Let's now think about B. So if we just scrub this off for a second. For B, we need to consider x squared minus x. And so whereabouts is x squared minus x? Well, x squared minus x, we graphed this up here. This is the parabola. And we need to consider where this would intersect with minus 1 over x, which is this same graph here. And so again, if we consider one being superimposed upon the other, how many times would they cross, if any? So if I were to superimpose now this parabola onto here, we'd have something that looks a bit like this. Comes down and up again like so. Okay, if you're not sure how low it would go, by the way, what I'd suggest you might want to do in case you're wondering if a sketch is betraying the accuracy, is find the minimum point, find the turning point of x squared minus x. So I'm sort of going off on a slight tangent here, okay? but it's worth noting that rather than guessing how low should it go, should it be like this or a bit lower so it does touch, it shouldn't touch, but I'm going to show you why not. So if ever you're unsure, do some calculations. So this one, we can complete the square by saying it's the same as x, minus a half squared minus a quarter. Okay, so the turning point here is going to be a half minus a quarter. So when x is a half, that's the lowest it goes. The lowest it goes is at minus a quarter for y. But when x is a half here, we're going to have y for this 
function which is the reciprocal, y is going to be minus 1 divided by a half. That's going to be minus 2. And so as this one's coming up, this one's never going to go anything but stay below the x-axis. So if we're never going to touch here, this one's going to be at minus a half for y. Down here is minus 2. So they're never going to touch. But they will touch here, look. Okay. They do intersect once. So for your b, I want you to write down that there's one solution. So let's move on to another one. Let's have a look at C. So C, again we're considering minus 1 over x in this, but this time we're looking at this quartic one. So how many times does this quartic intersect with y equals minus 1 over x? So again, if I just superimpose a quartic sketch on top here, it's going to be something like this. A little wobble and up again. Quite clearly, that's only going to give one intersection. So one intersection, one solution. So that's got one as well. Next up is D. So looking at D, we've got x squared minus x, crop them up again. So x squared minus x is this one here. Now we're thinking about where this would meet, if it were to meet at all, 1 over x squared. And 1 over x squared is this one here. Okay, so how many times, if any, would these meet? So for this time, I'm going to draw the quadratic on top of the y equals 1 over x squared. So we'd have this. So hopefully you'll see this would intersect twice, once here and once there. Okay, so it would have two solutions. So for D, we need to write two solutions. Next we come to E. So we're moving through these fairly speedily actually. So let's keep up the momentum. For E, we've got x squared brackets x minus 1 all squared. Again, this quartic features. So I'm going to color code this one in yellow. And we need to think where that would equal minus 1. Well, look at this quartic here. It doesn't go below the x-axis at all. So what it's asking here is when does this red line ever meet this red line here? Well, it just wouldn't. This is at a minimum of 0 because it's a product of two squared terms. So it could never be anything but non-negative. So it could never be minus 1. For that reason, e has zero solutions. So if we move on to have a look at f, or in fact to leave, I'll leave it on because we're talking about this quartic again here. Now this equation here, we need to think about this being rearranged. Okay, so for f, if we add 1 over x squared to both sides, This is the same as saying when is x squared brackets x minus 1 all squared equal to 1 over x squared. So by rearranging this, we can now make this make more sense and we can use our sketches now. And so when does this quartic intersect with 1 over x squared, which we've got over here? So 1 over x squared is this one here. gone slightly off there, but you can see what I'm trying to colour code. Okay, so this time I'm going to superimpose a quartic onto this reciprocal graph. So it comes down, meets the origin, has a little wobble, goes down again, and comes back up. Okay, so this would have two solutions. Now, it's tempting to think, well, this little wobbly bit 
how did you know? How did I know? It doesn't come up so high, but it touches again and hits maybe three times or maybe even four times. So how are we to know? And what I'd suggest we do for this one is to be thinking how high the graph is where this bump is at its highest. This bump by symmetry is going to be at its highest, surely either at x being a half, which is halfway between zero or one, or very close to a half at the latest. So what I'd suggest we do is we evaluate both functions where x is equal to a half. So if you were to do that on a class quiz, for example, remember sketches are great, but don't rely all the time on a sketch. If in doubt, do a calculation. So if x were a half here, this one here would have a y value of a half squared brackets 0.5 minus 1 all squared. So that's going to be 1 16th. That's 0 0.06, so it's still very, very low. And then goes lower. Whereas when x is a half for y equals 1 over x squared, this one the reciprocal would give a value of 1 over 0 0.5 squared, which would be 4. And so this reciprocal is going to definitely be higher than this bump and will remain higher than it because this bump is going to go down. And it will only cross when the quartic decides to come back up again. And so please don't always rely on a sketch. If in doubt, if you've got some critical values or the sketch becomes ambiguous, use calculations at the critical or awkward values to just confirm whether they'd intersect or not. So hopefully you can see the calculator just confirmed that actually they would only intersect twice. So therefore, for F, they'd have two points of intersection. Next up, we need to think about G. So... Let's clear off that one. We're still talking about 1 over x squared. But this time we're thinking about when this cubic, x brackets x minus 1 all squared. I might use a purple colour actually now, just for the hell of it. When does this one intersect with a reciprocal 1 over x squared? So when does this one ever become the same as 1 over x squared. So again, it's just a case of thinking about superimposing one on top of the other and seeing how many times they'd cross over. That's all that there is really to this whole exercise, to be honest. However, it is an important skill to know how to use correctly. So, it's easier, I believe, if I superimpose the reciprocal on top of a cubic. So if I were to do that, we can see in this quadrant there's going to be no intersection at all. But then if we have a look at the next quadrant, there is going to be one point of intersection, which is going to be somewhere here. So one point of intersection means one solution. We now look at h. So for h, we're going to consider where the cubic is equal to minus 1. So whereabouts is this line, this curve, going to be equal to minus 1? How many times does it cross here? It crosses just once, clearly, around here. So one point of intersection one solution. And finally, for i, what we need to do for i is to consider where x squared minus x, which we have up here, is equal to minus 1. If we were to subtract 1 from both sides of this equation, it would become x squared minus x equal to minus 1. So we can rearrange this and think of it in this way. In other words, 
where is this one here going to be equal to minus 1? Now again, this presents a problem. This obviously becomes minus at some point, but how low does it go? Does it go as low as minus 1? Well, if you remember what I said earlier, it doesn't go that low. If I complete the square again on this, in case you didn't remember what I said earlier, uh, complete the square, so x squared becomes x, we half the 1, so instead of minus 1, we put minus a half, all squared, then minus off a half all squared, so we minus off a quarter. So the turning point, the lowest point, is when x is a half and y is a quarter. The lowest it goes is a quarter, sorry, minus a quarter, I mean to say. So it doesn't go as low as minus 1. So that one has no solutions. So reading from A through to I, what you should have got is 0, 1, 1, 2, 0, 2, 1, 1, 0 for the numbers of solutions for these nine equations respectively. Now for number three. We need to use the sketches or otherwise, so we don't have to, we need to create some equations that have more than two solutions. For question two, we just made equations that have zero, one or two solutions. So what about ones that have three or more? So let's write these equations in the boxes below. So the hint I've given you is to focus on the cubic and quartic ones and imagine new lines or graphs that would intersect those. So one I've made up here is for this cubic. So I'm going to write down this cubic, which is x brackets x minus 1 all squared. Could we imagine a line that cuts this one three times? And what I imagined, I'll just emphasize as well, these three equations, there's literally infinitely many you could do. Don't just copy me, use your imagination and use Desmos to see if you could create other lines which intersect three or more times. This one here, I was thinking, you can see it goes through the origin and it's in the positive quadrant and this negative quadrant as well. So what I was thinking when I was doing this, which doesn't need to be what you have to think as well, by any means, is I just imagined a line with a very, very small gradient going through the origin, like a gradient of a tenth or something like that. A straight line with a shallow gradient would surely have to hit this line at three different points. Now these are so close together, you might need to put your spectacles on, intersect there, there, and there. So this gradient here could be a tenth, could be a hundredth. As long as it's really, really shallow, it would intersect. So I'm going to say this is equal to 0.1x, or maybe even 1 over 10x. That would have three solutions. Another one I thought about was I looked at the graph of, or thought rather, about the graph of x cubed. Okay, so if you think about the graph of x cubed, I'll just clear some space here so you can just see what it looked like. So a graph of x cubed will be something like this. We go through the origin. Then I thought, if I had a straight line, which had a fairly steep gradient this time, rather than quite shallow, something like this, that would also have to intersect the curve three times. So just using my imagination, I thought, well, this one would have one, two, three. And so x cubed would meet the curve, say, 2x, 3x, maybe even 5x, three times. The point of this exercise, by the way, is just to get you thinking. There's no easy way, there's no formula for working out what equations your imagination can think of. Explore 
think, experiment, use Desmos, use software to help you come up with these equations. I'd rather it take you half an hour and you get three, rather than you spend two minutes just copying down mine. If you want to explore these and find out for yourselves, you'll get a lot out of this exercise. Lastly, as a suggestion, I looked at the quartic. I looked at x squared brackets x minus 1 all squared. If you watched the earlier part of the video, I mentioned this little bump here that goes upwards was 1 16th high. This is where x is 0 0.0625. So when I got thinking, if you had a straight line where y equals a positive tiny value, which I'll just draw on here to illustrate, it would intersect this quartic four times. So if I imagine a tiny line like this, which could zoom in to make it clearer, that would intersect the curve four times. Go here, 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 and here. In fact, just for clarity, I'm just going to pop back onto the previous screen just to show you these four points of intersection a bit clearer. Okay, so if I just go onto here, that's go that one further actually. So this quartic, if I drew a line in, you can see here it would be possible to draw a line which would have four points of intersection. One, two, three, four. So hopefully that's a bit clearer in terms of what I'm trying to show you. So the point being, as long as it's y equals a tiny positive value, that would have four points of intersection. So let's go for 0 0.01. So x squared brackets x minus 1 squared equals 0 0.01x. That would indeed have four solutions, which meets the criteria for having more than two. So try your own, be creative. Use sine and cosine if you want to, use trig, I don't care. The main idea for those is to use your imagination and go wild. Okay, that's all from me. If you've got to the end and you've got some time to have a look at some more, I would suggest you go to page 70, exercise 4D, and try questions 5, 6, then 8, 9, 10, to give yourself some more practice. So with practice will come the understanding. But thanks for getting through that video and to listening and to subscribing if you had. If you got stuck on any part, do send me an email or ask me in class, and I'll hopefully see you again very soon. Bye for now.